March, March, March of the Indies, March of the Indies, March, March, March of the Indies, March of the Indies. Hi, Kiwis! It is time. We made it. I have been collecting books all year long, and by all year long, I mean since last March of 2019. If you are new to this, welcome. This is the month where I read exclusively indie published books. But I'll also be reading some other ones, but I'll explain that in a moment. I go to a plethora of conventions over the year, and we're in this accent now. And I meet a lot of other indie authors like myself. And I don't know about you, but I'm not really a person who buys a lot of books. Um, I just, I think they, they clutter too much and I definitely prefer ebooks over physical books because I just don't like having that many surrounding me all of the time. So, what? Oh, oh the, these are... <laughs> anyway, so these are all the indie books I bought since last March. Ah! Uh, uh, oh god, they're gonna fall. Oh god. Ah! Yeah, they fell. And I do have some ebooks as well. So, let's get into March of the Indies. Yep, first off, I am gonna mention the ebooks because I will probably be reading ebooks first. Why? Because I'm about to go on a little trip for a wedding in another state and I don't want to bring all of these books with me. So I'm going to mention some that I will be reading at the end of February because they also fit into the theme of last month, which is all of the black authors that I've been reading. So first off, we have Shattered by Aphrodite Lee. So Aphrodite Lee is also another author tuber. I will put a link into the description for her channel. She does a lot of awesome live streams, especially if you're an aspiring author. Great live streams to be productive. And I'm gonna read you the blurb. Be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. Aaliyah Shaw applied for and received a spot to attend a prestigious school for the arts for her senior year. All expenses paid. She is excited to start living her life the way she believes all other people her age do. But her dreams of freedom and new adventures are quickly doused when Aaliyah finds out that she is not exactly welcomed by the vast majority of the student body. With his popularity and status in the school taking a big hit because of Aaliyah, the big man on campus, Chase Sophos, makes it his goal to take her down at every turn. Her situation quickly grows to even more problematic when she catches the eye of another young man, Spencer Caprio, with many issues of his own. Her new world is turned completely upside down as she tries to make sense of all the things happening around her. She learns fast that being smart is not the same as knowing everything. Her academic career, her innocence, and her life are threatened as Aaliyah makes her way through the day-to-day -day reality of being accepted at Halstead Prep. So this sounds really cool and I'm excited. It's kind of dark, <laughs> contemporary, mystery, woo! And the cover looks great. I'm sorry. It's got that pop of purple and I'm like, whoo! But it is book one, I believe, in the Glass Corridor series. So there you go. That's probably the first one I'll read while I'm at the airport. The next ebook I have is by another author tuber, Alec Lee Williams, and their book is called Immortal Scars. And I believe this is a queer fantasy. Let's see. James Miller is just trying to stay under the radar while he goes through life without killing someone. Relatable. But when he agrees to go out with Haley, everything is flipped upside down. He didn't expect to fall in the middle of a sibling rivalry. He definitely didn't think he'd have his past thrown in his face, something he had tried hard to forget. To make matters worse, the sexiest man he has ever seen is sniffing around and won't leave him alone. Andrew wants to protect the city. It's the least he can do. He and his partner made it their mission to keep the supernatural world away from the human, but he definitely never expected to meet anyone like James. The problem is that the man will not take his help, but he is in danger and Andrew is determined to protect him, whether James likes it or not because heaven and earth are about to collide and he'll be damned if he stands on the sidelines. Can they work together to save the world and find the love they both need, or are the scars too deep? This one does come with a few trigger warnings of explicit male male sexual content, self-harm, um, brief mention of sexual child abuse, and a mention of drug use. So, FYI, this one looks like a very exciting read, and again, the cover, please. And I will also link Alex's channel down below. I'm gonna link everybody, really. And the last book that I have from February transitioning into March 
is Rum and Redemption by Dahlia De Winters. This is a very short story. I guess it's a short story. It's only like 36 pages, so very easy read for an airport wait. But this one is Former Slave Lucy escapes a devastating shipwreck and washes up onto a strange shore. Finding shelter in what she believes to be an old fishing shack, she's visited by a handsome ghost with a tragic history who invites her to be his companion. Intent upon starting a new life as a free woman, she resists him at first. However, Lucy soon realizes the weathered house is more than it seems, and is trapped there until she makes a soul-altering choice which will determine her future in this world or the next. This feels like a nice spooky short story that's great for reading on a plane or in the airport because I'll be in airport for a while. Gotta love layovers. She has a few other books. If I get through a couple of the books that I'll be bringing with me and I have more time to read ebooks, I will probably also read her book called True Blue. It's a bunch. She writes like a lot. Definitely check out her full like Amazon page. She has a bunch of books but I'm, I thought at least having a really nice quick read like that will help me get through airport stuff and also help me get to 200 books this year. And the last ebook I have pre-planned is called All's Well in Asgard by EJ Lowell. I met EJ last year at Cosign. I adore them. They're great and I'm so excited now that there's a book out. It's only 157 pages, so again, nice, quick read. But the premise of this just sounds so fun. So here you have two college students run into Odin at a coffee shop, and he offers them a job. The catch? They don't know it's him at first. Raylene wants to graduate and be a teacher. Dublin wants to be done with school and out of debt already. When a chance encounter at a diner with a pair of unlikely brothers results in an invitation to the Grey Horse Limousine Service, the two students find themselves with an opportunity that seems too good to be true. Questions abound as they take on a strange mission for an even stranger company. Who are Iggy and Kenneth Grey? Why does a limousine service need diplomat? And what is an Udgard exactly? Join Raylene in Dublin as they navigate the politics of a world that shouldn't exist and attempt to stop a war between gods in the process. All's well in Asgard, but in Jotunheim, it's a different story. This is so fun! I'm so excited. EJ, I cannot wait to read this. That is the four I have on my Kindle app on my phone. I have an actual Kindle as well. I just didn't want to bring it out. Also, it's battery's dead. Let's talk about them physical books. The first one I've been holding on for a long time, I think I picked this up in maybe April of last year, and that is Color World by Rachel E. Kelly. This is book one. I think there are a bunch of books because I remember seeing the stand and there was like, I don't know, maybe five or six books in this series already, but love the cover. Totally forgotten what it's about because it's been a while since I picked it back up. We've got Reveal the Invisible. Wendy, a 19-year-old college student, can sense emotions when she touches people. As the sole caregiver for her younger brother Ezra, she is strapped for cash and decides to participate in an allergy study involving energy therapy. But something goes wrong, and when Wendy wakes up, she learns that someone is dead and it was her skin that did it. Unable to touch people for fear of hurting them, Wendy is on the hunt for answers. Did they mean to make her a weapon? or something else entirely. That's when she finds out she's not the only one to wake up with mysterious powers. Superhuman abilities are real. Gabe, who works with the company responsible, feels badly about what happened and offers his help. Together they learn that Wendy was targeted for a specific reason and it has nothing to do with her death touch. So this seems super fun. I like that I can consider this new adult because it's 19 year old college student. We need more. We need this genre to be like a real thing because there are so many books that fall in between this gray area of being YA but not quite adult fiction and this feels like it'll be new adult. The next books are part of a trilogy. Actually, I think there might be a fourth book coming out, but currently it's a trilogy. This one I picked up while at Mile High Con this year, and you've seen me mention this in a few other videos before, but that is The Ace's High Trilogy by O.E. Tierman. This is also a pen name because it's written by a couple authors. The first book is called The Hands Were Given, followed by Call the Bluff, and concluding with Raise the Stakes, but maybe not concluding. Let's see what this one's about. Aiden Headley, or Headley, I'm so sorry, I don't know, never wanted to be the man giving orders. That's fine with the Democratic State Force base he's been assigned to command. They don't like to take orders. Nicknamed the Wild Cards, they used to be the most effective base against the seven corporations owning the former United States in a war that has lasted over half a century. Now the Wild Cards are known for creative insubordination, chaos, and commanders begging to be reassigned. Aiden is their last chance. If he can pull off his assignment as commander and yank his ragtag crew of dreamers and fighters together, maybe they can get back to 
doing what they came to do, fighting for a country worth living in. Life's a bitch. She deals off the bottom of the deck, but you play the hands you're given. So this seems very, very fun. This is a good, like, cyberpunky series, and I think it'll be very, very fun. I do know that I was warned about some explicit scenes, so fair warning for that. As long as I have warning to those things, my little ace heart is A-OK. -okay. Switching gears entirely into middle grade land, we have Red Dragon's Keep by Natalie Vanderwerken. I met Natalie a couple mile high cons ago, but I finally was able to pick up her book. And this is the first, I believe, of five as well of the Dragon's Children series. It's also a Best Book Awards finalist, so that's really cool. So here we go. Demons want to kill him, dragons need to save him. Mages, demons, and a talisman plague firstborn son and heir Thomas Arak in the first book of the Dragon's Children fantasy series. Thomas wants desperately to earn his father's respect. Kept safe from danger all his life, he's bitterly sure he'll never be allowed to learn the arts of war. When danger threatens, will his father finally let him learn how to fight? Sabotage and reason changed Thomas's life forever. Tales of dragons that fought beside men against demons have faded into legend. Ancient record tells of an amulet, part of an ancient talisman, a talisman that can call the dragons back. Will Thomas learn the lessons of war, master the magic hidden in his blood, find the dragon amulet, and prepare the defense of his family's home before the demons arrive? Secret passages, amulets, magic, and swords of light. Can Thomas bring everything together to save Red Dragon's Keep? I feel like this is a book I definitely would have loved reading as a kid. And I do know that for um, Natalie has based a lot of the characters on her own grandkids, which I think is adorable. So if you're looking more for a middle grade novel, here you go. Back into YA land. We move on to a new author that I met this year at Mile High Con, and that is Promises Left for Dead by Beckham Lore. And this is actually a teen author who has published her first book. Um, I have been a little worried about it, just because I feel like I'll need readers for it. Wow, I'm getting old. The font is pretty tiny, but it is a very big book, so I don't blame them for going with a smaller font. That means big story inside. I also love that she got an embossed. She has raised text. Like how? I can't even get that on my books. This is actually published by Synergy Books, and apparently they can do that. Let's take a look-see. You should have killed me when you had the chance. Now I will be your downfall. For the sake of the people you lied to, I will restore the promises you left for dead. Legacy Westbay, age 17, is about to be executed for treason. Her only crime? Giving aid to those persecuted by their power-hungry dictator. She has one last chance to prove her loyalty to Kedna by becoming a soldier for the government that took everything from her. But when her second chance at life ignites a spark in the heart of the nation, could the changing of the tides be just coincidence or is it fate? This is her debut novel. I'm not sure if it's a series or a standalone, so we will figure that out once we read it. I I think it's a series. I think I remember talking to her about it, that there is another book planned. This should be a very interesting read. I'm excited uh, because you don't really see a lot of teen authors, you know, publishing their book and stuff, which is pretty, pretty awesome. Hi. I fell me. I heard, so I came to interrupt. Cool. With your special guest, Alpaca. My special guest. Thanks. Special guest. I got an alpaca. And some pumps. And some pumps. Thanks. You wanna, You're welcome. Wanna say hi? Sure. Come interrupt really quick. Hi, look who's interrupting and gave me an alpaca. That's from mom, not me. I bought different stuff. Well then, screw you. <laughs> and now, completely out of the fiction world, we have a look into space, shall we say. A little bit more than just space, but that's why I picked it up, because space. So this is Who's Who in the Cosmic Zoo, A Spiritual Guide to ETs, Aliens, Gods, and Angels by Ella LeBain. There are many books in this series isn't like a narrative story. This has a lot of different theories about aliens and spirituality. Um, so it's kind of this exploration. I don't know 100% obviously because I haven't read it yet, but I will be reading it this month. It might be a little bit difficult for me to get through just because I don't normally read books of this sort, but I am a firm believer in exploring outside of your genre. This is the first one in it, so it does explore like aliens and maybe maybe some conspiracy theories, I'm not sure, but I I like the information, but I've never read a book about it. So we'll see 
what I think of that. This is what it says on the back. It's a plot summary, but it says over a hundred million people have witnessed UFOs and have wondered who are they? What are their agendas? Why are they here now? Who is who in the Cosmic Zoo answers all the these questions and more like no other book set has ever done before. Who's Who in the Cosmic Zoo is a three-part series focusing on a spiritual discernment of various multidimensional beings including extraterrestrials, aliens, gods, and angels. It describes the ancient drama that has spiraled through our galaxy for millennia, one that humans have long been enmeshed in, though most of us remain blissfully unaware of our compromised position. So the first book is ETs and aliens, the second one is gods and ETs, and the third book is about angels and ETs. So this one will be focused on ETs and aliens, which is like I'm in. The next three books I've already mentioned before in my January book haul and these are three books by the same author but not in the same series but the author is Corbin Dunn. This is Alec Hines Gun. We have The Spires of Respite and The Man of a Thousand Eyes. First one I'm going to be picking up is going to be The Man of a Thousand Eyes because it was so similar to my own. So I'll read you that one real quick. To Sarah Booker, it was just an old house left to her by a grandparent that she never spoke to. A money pit she was eager to be rid of. To the locals, it was a legend, a place of horrific tales that simply drew them to the place more. Their macabre interests fueled by decades of myths with little else to hold their attention in Herondale. To the professor, it was a harmless curiosity, the smallest grain of dust on a world overflowing with the darkest of filth. Not something worth bothering over as the shadows within kept to themselves. But to him, that house was everything. A thousand thousand eyes gazed out from the windows of Booker House, and a hungry mouth sat waiting behind its door. And that house was about to become everything for us all. It actually feels a little bit like Rose Red. So... <laughs> So for the Spires of Respite, redemption is something that cannot be earned except by those who have already lost. Lost their way, lost themselves, or lost their minds. The road is difficult and becomes more so the further you fall. For those who have fallen the furthest, it is more difficult still. For those who have lost their very lives, redemption seems to be forever out of their grasp. Karabia is a demon, sentenced to hell upon her death. She struggles to find purpose and hope where there is none. Respite is a treacherous city, the only one in hell, and it offers no sanctuary for the damned. It is a reflection of the chaotic world above, an ever-shifting puzzle where there is no familiarity, no mercy. The demon lords rule over this place beside Lucifer, wielding power unimaginable to mere mortals. And yet it is they who have lost the most, who have fallen the furthest, and have the longest climb ahead of them. I'm feeling that, because I love, you know, like Dante Inferno. This gives me those vibes, but in a very different way. So, and lastly, Alakine's gun. The continent of Ammon remains as the last bastion for the various mortal races, the rest of the planet extinguished by the mysterious unthinkable of a century past. The scattered colonies function mostly in isolation, and travel between them is treacherous indeed. But a pair of Sky Touch sisters make a living in hazardous waste, their skill in combat seeing many a traveler safely to their destination. When a man named Alakine approaches them, he seems like just another ordinary customer, at least at first. But what he seeks is no mere trade route or profit. He seeks answers to what ended the world so long ago. The colonies are fractured, each race blaming the other for this disaster, and only the truth can bring them together. All right, so we've got post-apocalyptic, complete fantasy in hell, and urban fantasy. We've got some range, people. The next author I met at Mile High Con probably three years ago, and I don't know why I hadn't picked up her books before. I've always wanted to. They look amazing. They sound amazing. We have The Arcane Adventures by Vanessa Robertson. I appreciate the whole double A thing. Ashbury Archives, Arcane Adventures. I appreciate that. But we have Canathrope, which is the first book. I believe the second book is The Clockwork Emperor, and then the third book of The Rail Spectre. These covers are so good. Like, they feel so professional. I believe this is a steampunk with tarot magic. So let's take a look-see. London, 1899. The old century turns to make way for the new, and Vivian Harper's fate is in the cards. Vivian yearns for freedom, as well as the security to care for those she loves. She is engaged to a drunken, gambling lout, but at least he comes from a good name. And and yet, she dreams of something more than becoming a man's property. Mysterious murders begin happening in the great city of London, murders that most people are ready to turn a blind eye to in support of the new emporium. But these murders aren't the only mysterious forces at work. A group of civilians have taken it upon themselves to cleanse the city of all things deemed unnatural or archaic in this rapidly changing world, including her parents, an apothecary and a fortune teller. But none of that compares to the mystical world hiding within London. Vivian's life is turned upside down and she is thrust into a world she never believed existed. A world of magic, 
pirates, demons, armies of the dead, and a man who seeks to harness ancient magic capable of remaking men into monsters. Partnered with the most unlikely of companions, she must find the strength and the power within herself and the magic of the tarot to save everything that she loves. London is filled with secrets, including the most remarkable dog with a power no one would believe. Magic dog. I hope the dog's okay. But this seems so exciting. I am living for it. I'm just so sad that it's, on, it's so far down on my TBR because this seems like a very fun, like, read it in one go read because you're just that sucked in. Hopefully it ends up that way for me. So last year in Book of the Indies, one of the best books that I read was Apparent Power by Daisha M. Arnold. So I'm gonna read you the back of Apparent Power so you guys can get the gist of this amazing book. A dormant gene awakens in a quarter of the world's population and the effects are apocalyptic. With an even rarer gene, the life of Valerie Russell turns into a shocking race against time. When the human body begins to require more electricity than needed to keep a heart beating, cars lose power, phones no longer function, and planes fall from the sky. Stranded in southern Colorado, a hundred miles from home and from her two-year-old son, Valerie must find it within herself to trek the distance with the help of a questionable assembly of ex-military friends of the family. But the awakening has a different effect on Valerie. While others absorb electricity, Valerie's abilities are not as limited, making her the key to unlocking a worldwide genocide of those who are not affected. As she evades the rising totalitarian government, Valerie is also faced with a moral choice, risk failure and attempt to save the masses from the regime's deadly plot or run and preserve only the lives of her family. How does a mother make such an impossible choice? And we're going to dive into Sasha's story and she becomes a member of the Reactants, which I think is like the rebel organization that sprouts up from this whole worldwide catastrophe and new rule. And lastly is a book I picked up at Minicon and that is Unkillable Joe by Joe Valen. This is kind of a dark humor I believe. Uh, Joe has a podcast called The Mighty Pen Podcast and is also a comic book artist but this is his novel which I think also breaks uh, fourth wall a lot which seems really fun. What does a warrior queen from space, an all-powerful god, and a necromancing frog have in common? Whatever it is, it has something to do with this book. Unkillable Joe is what happens when a subpar comic creator accidentally obtains the power to destroy the universe with the stroke of a pen. It sounds far-fetched, but it could happen to anyone. Who's your maker? That's the entire blurb, so I don't really know the entire plot of this. That's the last one on my TBR list for March of the Indies, or is it? It's not. As you know, for a lot of indie creators, audiobooks are very difficult to do. I'm endeavoring to do that this year, and it's difficult, especially when your voice is dying. We must delve into the TBR bag. But wanna know something really funny? I had to update the TBR bag. So these are all the books on my shelf. These are all the audiobooks now. So we're gonna pull, we're gonna see how many we do. I'm, I intend to pull at least five, but if I pull something that has like a big series, um, then I might adjust that. So, four audiobooks. Here we go. The first one, oh boy, is a big book. This is Moon Chosen by PC Cast. As you can see, it's a very big book. Uh, it's almost 600 pages. I was trying to save this for September during Big Book Month, but eh, we'll do it now. There are three books, and so I will read all three of those. So we'll see what I get for the next books. You read a lot of audiobooks during the month though, thanks to work, so. Let's go. Huh. Strange Grace by Tessa Grattan. I don't know if this has a series, but I think the only audiobook I have is gonna be one. So that's one audiobook. Next one. The next one. Oh, it's kinda, oh, I really wanna shuffle them all up. Oh, one fell out. That's the one we're doing. This one's gonna be spooky. This was actually released last year, I believe. Yes, it did. 2019. I keep getting pink ones. The Gilded Wolves by Roshni Chakshi. Yes, this was picked up because of its beautiful cover. I have heard mixed reviews for this one. Um, a lot of people getting bored with it, but we'll see how I like the audiobook version of that. And there you go. There's my March of the Indies, March of the Indies. Let's read a bunch of books again. How many books is that? That's 22 books. 22 books in the March. It's fine. What books are you guys reading in March? Put them down below. Are you doing your own March of the Indies? Let me know. Maybe we can buddy read some of these. And if you're looking for an indie book to read, you can always 
choose mine. And if you guys like this video and the other content that I create, please check out my coffee page and you can buy me a hot chocolate or you can commission me to do stuff. I have commissions open. You can get a shout out on one of these videos. You can force me to read a book that will immediately go on my TBR and will be read within the month of its request unless it's requested like the last day of March. It'll be read within 30 days. And there's lots of other commissions available on my coffee page, so please go check it out. Go check out all of these authors as well. I will link everybody's pages down below if they are YouTubers or their Amazon pages. Of course, reach me down in the comments or on Facebook, Tumblr, and Twitter. I'll see you next time, cuties. Bye!